Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neeraj Shaw, the Director of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Lambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Lambrew and I are here today to talk with you about where we are with respect to COVID-19 for the entire state of Maine for today, Tuesday, April 6th, 2021. Right now across the state, there are a total of 52,276 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 290 cases since yesterday. Cumulatively, overall, 1,705 people have been hospitalized. And right now in Maine, there are 80 people in the hospital with COVID-19. 32 of them are in a critical care unit and eight of them are on a ventilator. Sadly, throughout the pandemic, 746 Maine people have died with COVID-19. I'd like to take a second to provide one note on the case numbers that I've mentioned. In recent days, the number of new positive test results, either PCR or antigen, that are being reported to Maine CDC every day exceeds what we are able to review and analyze within a 24 hour period. As a result of that, the number of cases that I'm reporting to you today does not necessarily reflect the number of new cases of COVID-19 in Maine in the past 24 hours. It may in fact be in the past 72 hours, even a bit longer. Folks may remember that we've been here before when we had a previous uptick in cases late last year. As with that last time, our priority is to move people to our epidemiology team to assist with reviewing and analyzing the increased number of test results that are coming in every single day. Folks may also remember that as with last time, there may be an increase in the daily case count in the coming days. And those daily numbers that we report out may themselves not necessarily reflect the new cases that have happened in the past day. Our website, however, will always display on a graph when those new cases were diagnosed or when those individuals first started reporting symptoms. So our website will still be the place where folks can track the evolution of the pandemic. But the new daily case counts in Maine may fluctuate as we move additional folks to our epidemiology team to help review those increasing number of case reports. I just wanted to make sure that we, we, were, we were being straight with everybody on that. Turning now to testing. Our positivity rate in Maine now stands at just under 3%. 2.97%. And our testing volume for PCR tests stands at 548 PCR tests that we're doing for every 100,000 people. Antigen testing, similarly, where the rate now stands at 6% and a testing volume of 164 antigen tests that are being run across the state for every 100,000 people. Turning now to vaccines and vaccinations. Cumulatively, there have now been 780,592 doses of COVID-19 vaccine administered across the state. 463,663 of those are first doses. 316,929 of those are among folks who have completed their vaccine series. Let me put a little pers a bit of perspective around those numbers. If you take a look at the entire state of Maine, all 1,344,000 of us, 34.5% of Mainers have received at least a first dose, and 23.6% have completed their vaccine series. Over one in three has received at least a first dose, and just about one in four have completed their vaccine series. And if you zero in, not on all Maine people, but just on those who are 16 and over, who tomorrow will be eligible for vaccine, if you just take a look at that subgroup, four out of 10 have received at least their first shot, and just, about, uh, just under 
have completed their vaccine series. I urge everyone to take a look at the data yourself on our updated dashboard. You can navigate to maine.gov slash COVID-19 slash, co uh, slash vaccines slash dashboard, which is a hard thing to navigate to, or you can just go to bing.com and search for Maine COVID vaccine dashboard, which is how I usually navigate to that. We've added new views and new ways to chart the progress of vaccination in Maine, both on a historical level as well as on a county by county level. I urge everyone to take a minute, take a look at the data and see for yourself how Maine is doing on the vaccine front. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew. Thank you, Director Shaw. I am happy to announce today that the Mills Administration and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, are launching a groundbreaking mobile vaccination unit next week. It will be New England's second FEMA-supported mobile vaccination unit and its third nationwide. It will begin providing COVID-19 vaccines to Maine people starting next Monday, April 12th, at the Oxford Casino in Oxford, Maine. The mobile unit will then travel to about 10 additional rural or underserved communities across Maine, including Freiburg, Calais, and Madawaska over the next two months. These communities were selected based on, in part, their measure of social vulnerability. In other words, the US CDC has an index that measures different levels of community supports to figure out what communities may need support before, during, or after disasters. We also looked at where other sites were already offering COVID-19 vaccines. The mobile vaccination unit will vaccinate about 250 people per day, utilizing the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine in order to maximize efficiency. Appointments are required to receive a vaccination at the mobile unit. For the Oxford Casino site, Oxford County residents may call the state's community vaccination line at 1-888-445 4111. That's 1 888 445 4111. Information on scheduling appointments at the other stops will become available on the state's vaccine website in the coming days. The mobile clinic will complement our existing vaccination effort, allowing us to get to people in remote or underserved communities and allowing them to more easily get their vaccines. As Governor Mills stated, we are grateful to the Biden administration for its commitment to partnering with the state to get people vaccinated and FEMA for their outstanding work to deliver on that promise. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Shaw, for questions. Great, thanks a lot, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew and I are delighted to turn to our colleagues in the media, take questions. The, the mobile unit in particular is a big step forward to us, so really happy to be able to talk about that. The first question for uh, from our colleagues today goes to Charlie Eichacker from Maine Public. Yeah, hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, so I do have a follow-up question about, first of all, the vaccine unit. Um, can you explain more how your, who are the um, agencies or organizations or entities that are on the ground in these communities sort of coordinating um, this process and appointments and all that? Sure. I'll just start by saying that this is a prototype that was developed by the Biden administration's you know, Federal Emergency Management Agency to figure out how it can help support um, both rural states and large states. We've seen their community vaccination clinics in big stadiums in urban areas. This is one of their first ones is going to be in rural and underserved communities. So they will primarily staff it with support by, from the state of Maine. We are working with the local communities, town and city managers, the local public health liaisons to make sure we have ground support. We are then going to be working in each of these communities with community-based organizations, veterans organizations, healthcare providers, others, to try to raise awareness of this special unique opportunity. These mobile clinics will only be in each of these sites for as few as three days, as many as five days, so they won't be there for long. So we do urge people when they hear about the mobile vaccine unit coming to their state to sign up to get one of those appointments. 
Okay. Um, I uh, to change the subject slightly. I saw an announcement, um, and and this could be for Commissioner Lambrew, and thank you for that response also, and or Dr. Shaw. Uh, uh, that Maine is recreating the Office of Population Health Equity. And um, I guess I wanted to ask, why is that happening now, basically? Maybe I'll begin and then turn it over to Dr. Mm -hmm. Shaw. So COVID-19 has highlighted the disparities uh, in our Maine healthcare system in ways that have been really challenging for residents as well as the state and the providers who serve people. So what we did last year when we were trying to tackle those disparities is we did a fair amount of listening. We did a request for information. We tried to figure out not only how do we tackle COVID-19 that was more prevalent in those early days of the pandemic um, than in, among other groups, but what are those systematic problems? And in the process of that, we did learn, we asked about and learned that there had been an Office of Minority Health here in our department years ago. It was decommissioned, but the communities thought that would be a valuable first step, not the only step, but one step that we could take to begin to tackle some of the different types of disparities, racial, ethnic, different types of sexual orientation, rural manners. We have inequities in our system, and this Office of Population Health Equity was one of the ideas that came out of our listening and experience during COVID-19 to begin to tackle these challenges. I'll say one more word before I turn it over to Dr. Shaw. We are so grateful for Governor Mills supporting us in, in recreating this office. And we're thrilled that the American Rescue Plan offers some resources that we could be using to begin to actually tackle those disparities. But Dr. Shaw. Well, that, that was exactly the, the perfect place I was gonna pick up on. Uh, Charlie, You know, certainly the, the, the experience with COVID has sharpened our focus uh, of health equity issues. So that's been an impetus, but I think it's important to note that this was a plan that we had even before COVID. Uh, and indeed the availability now of additional resources uh, coming out of the American Rescue Plan allows us to take the blueprints that we had and now actually build them out and build a building around them. Uh, we have always envisioned resurrecting the Office of Health Population Health Equity within Maine CDC as the first step uh, toward having a broader equity focus across DHHS. But the availability of funds is a great opportunity to merge both of those things and not just have an office for the sake of having an office, but now have an office that can take action and try to move the needle. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. And, and I'm sorry, if I could just add one uh, uh, additional question, um, which is about uh, the vaccine availability kind of across the state, uh, we were looking at, or some of my colleagues were looking at like the Northern Light website and it seemed like there were some more openings in Bangor and Dover Foxcroft. And just anecdotally, we've heard there might be less availability in Southern Maine. Is there, are you looking at that? And, um, you know, is there any a hesitancy in Northern Maine or, or any plans to maybe shift the supply further South? It, well, certainly, you know, we do we do take into account as we are making decisions around weekly allocations where we see sustained demand. Uh, but Charlie, given that just in you know uh, ten hours from now, starting tomorrow, all Mainers will be eligible. Those who are sixteen and over, I think it's you know, we can't really say that there's pockets of hesitancy. What we're really seeing overwhelmingly across the state remains urgency, not hesitancy, particularly as we move into uh, different and more age groups. Okay, th thanks to both of you. Yep. Uh, let me go to next, no, go next to Brooke Riley from ABC7. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thanks so much for taking my question. And kind of going off the hesitancy question there, um, do you feel that there is any kind of sense of hesitancy in the state? And if so, why? And what would you say to people who might be hesitant to get the vaccine? Well, I, I suspect there's hesitancy across the United States, Maine being no different there. But I think it's really important to note that in terms of the percentage of population of Maine that has signed up and raised, raised their hand to say, I want to get vaccinated, I want to go through that process and protect myself and protect my family, we're one of the top ranked states right now, depending on which tracker you follow, we're either fourth or fifth or something of that nature. And that's credit to Maine people for saying, when that vaccine comes to my neighborhood, I wanna take it. So I mentioned a moment ago, more than four out of every 10 Maine people age 16 above 
has at least gotten one shot on board. And, and that puts us again in one of the top tiers of states. Right now, what we are seeing across the state is urgency, but we're also anticipating or planning for the possibility that there may be folks who are hesitant as well. Here's what I'd have to say. A lot of hesitancy comes down to trust. Maybe they don't trust government. Maybe they don't trust pharmaceutical companies. There's a lot of concerns with trust. What we've tried to do over the past year, Commissioner Wambrew and I and Governor Mills and others, is try to establish that trust. Generating trust can't be rushed. It's a conversation, it's not a campaign. And so what I'd ask is that if folks have questions, you raise those. I try from time to time to answer those questions. If you've got honest questions, earnest questions about whether the vaccine is for you, whether it's safe, whether it's effective, raise those, whether, whether by emailing Maine CDC, sending me a note on social media, and from time to time, we'll try to raise those. I wanna be respectful. I wanna know that folks have earnest questions and provide scientific answers back. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let me turn next to Amy Brown. Thanks, Dr. Shah. A couple of questions about variants, and then I have a quick question from a listener. Uh, can you give us an update on the status of variants in the state? And if a variant is detected in a specific area, whether there uh, have, if more samples are tested from that area, if it's tracked, whether or not it's taking off there? Sure. So right now, it, just within Maine itself, um, sort of here's where we are in terms of our variant count. Uh, overall, we've detected one case of the P1 variant, four cases of the 351 variant, and then 15 cases of the 117 variant. 117 variant. That's the variant first characterized in the UK. Uh, the way that we, and I should, I think it's important to note that the US CDC recommends that states sample about 5% uh, uh, of all of their positive results, that they send those for genetic sequencing to really characterize whether they are variants of concern or not. 5% is the CDC's recommended threshold. As of last week, Maine was doing over that. We were doing 5.3% as of about a week ago, and we're trying to increase that even more. So we've already exceeded what the US CDC sets as for what states should be doing. When we detect variants, we try to understand what the transmission patterns may be. Did the person travel? Whom they, for whom they may have exposed? Things of that nature. Right now, we don't do additional sampling in that area. We try to zero in on the case to see whether they have uh, potentially infected others. And that is entirely in line with what the US CDC recommends if and when states detect variants. So, for example, with the Franklin County case of the uh, P1 variant that was detected uh, maybe a week or two back, I think you reported that. Has there been any subsequent surge in cases in that community? There has not. Okay. Uh, and that's because of case investigation, right? So we speak with the people. We make sure that they are isolating. They have everything they need. So they reduce their likelihood of transmitting it to others. Okay. And uh, a listener noted, just shifting gears completely, that on the Northern Light Health website, the Blue Hill Clinic doesn't seem to be appearing there anymore. Uh, they noticed at some point uh, that it just stopped being available as a place to make appointments. And I got this email just before we came on. So I haven't checked with them, but I thought maybe you might have some idea if they are going offline permanently or if that's just because they're full. Or maybe Commissioner I, I would, I would some idea. I would refer you to Northern Light on that. Okay, so there's no like official shutdown of that site. You would have heard if they just were not going to be doing it at all anymore. I, I would refer you to Northern Light as to which sites they're operating week to week. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me go to Brian Sullivan next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I wonder uh, who should, who do you think this mobile vaccination uh, truck unit who are you targeting with this? And I just wonder uh, who should who should think that this is the right fit for them. And is there any aspect that goes that goes along with it in terms of a shuttle service or some sort of transportation that can help people who maybe can only are, are struggling to get to these mass vaccination sites? Sure. Um, so we are targeting with this mobile vaccination unit people who may struggle not just because of transportation 
which is a reminder, we do provide transportation to Maine residents for free to vaccination sites. If people do struggle with transportation, you can call our vaccine hotline to find out about that option if you have an appointment. But what we're thinking about with this unit is trying to find those spots that are not really close to a pharmacy or a hospital or a clinic that otherwise have people who may not be able to take off a lot of time from their jobs to get to a vaccine, that may have caregiving responsibilities and make it challenging for them to go from a place like Oxford or Freiburg to you know, a place that may be a while away, that the driving time, the vaccination time, and the return time may pose a barrier. So we just want to bring the vaccine to these communities. And we will then work with the local groups on the ground. It was a great question about who else is helping us. We are, these are community-oriented vaccine clinics. We really are going to work with all the town leadership, city leadership, to try to engage people, to make sure that they know about the opportunity, that they feel welcome, that they feel as though it, their answers are questioned for these sites. So it is to move vaccines to those communities that are underserved. And we also will continue to support transportation for people who need a ride to get to a vaccine center. Thank you. And I guess maybe a broader question for either one of you, but uh, tomorrow it opens up in terms of availability pretty widely in the state. Uh, Dr. Shaw, in your opening comments, you said about four out of 10 people ha have gotten it right now. You know, what's the road ahead look like? And, you know, if you look back to December when you started doing the, the first vaccines and we're at about 40% now, what's the road to herd immunity look like? And, and what will you be able to tell in these next couple of days here? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. And then, Commissioner, I'd love to hear uh, the Commissioner's reflections as well. Brian, just one data note, that 40% is of Maine people 16 and over. Uh, so just, just a note on that. Uh, of, of those who are older, it's a, of all Maine people, it's a slightly different number, but yeah, four in 10. You know, uh, Brian, uh, the commissioner and I were, were, were discussing this exact issue, and there were two things that stood out, I think, to, to me and, and perhaps to her as well, uh, comparing where we were in December versus where we are now. The first is the number of sites that we've got, the number of healthcare providers across the state of Maine, be they federally qualified health centers, community health centers, hospitals, large scale vaccination sites, pharmacies, everyone in between, who have all raised their hand and said, yep, I wanna help. I wanna provide vaccines in my community to people around me. That's something that I, I couldn't have imagined before. Um, and, and then the second corresponding to that is the rate of vaccines that we're getting. Uh, we, have, we have been receiving more vaccines as a nation than I think we thought we would. That's what's been allowing us to accelerate the question now is, can we keep that up? We've done our part in Maine. We've been working with healthcare providers for the past four or five weeks to say, what can you do to increase your throughput? What can you do to get more vaccinators on the line ready to go? Now we're just waiting for that increase in vaccine supply to come our way. Uh, but really credit there, Brian, uh, goes to healthcare providers across the state of Maine. When we asked for their help and their partnership, they said, absolutely, we are all in. And I think our numbers speak for themselves as a result. And I'll add that, you know, in the short term, in the next few days, what should people expect? As with any change, there's going to be bumps in the road. There will be people who try to get appointments and will be waiting longer than they would like. People may be getting multiple appointments and need to figure out how to deal with it. We also have some of those challenges of, for example, not every vaccine clinic has the Pfizer vaccine, so they all won't be able to vaccinate 16 and 17 year olds, for example. And we certainly heard a clamoring for additional sites that are places that want clinics to come to them. We will be working our way through all those bumps in the coming days and weeks. So I think we should just expect, people should expect a little bit of challenge in the coming days as we go from basically third year to fifth year. We're going from people age 50 and older today to people aged 16 and older tomorrow. And that's a pretty big transition. So we do urge people to be a little bit patient, but be persistent to go to the list of vaccine sites on our website, to find ones that are closest to you, to call, to check out their websites and to get an appointment. Thank you. Uh, yep, thanks Brian. Let me turn it over to Megan at WMTW next. Good afternoon. Um, with the 
uh, case count rising as it has, or you know, a little higher than we'd like it to be, and a positivity rate that's nearing three percent. I'm wondering if um, you all have discussed uh, a, either a pause button or a more gradual reopening plan that's maybe hinged around vaccination implementation, as it seems like that part is kind of ramping up now. Um, would that make sense or be safer? Um, maybe giving people an incentive to sign up. Is that something that's been discussed or is it just trains left the station kind of thing? We always discuss what our public health protocols are. That is a constant, it's been a constant for the past year, over a year. Governor Mills checks with us every week about how are we doing? What more can we do? How do we keep people safe? As a reminder, we did make some changes in early March. Some were effective in mid towards the end of March, but we're not see expecting major changes again until the end of May. Um, at the pace we're going, we may be in a lot better place on vaccination by the end of May. We're hopeful that that's the case, that with a ramp up in eligibility, as well as the number of doses coming to Maine, by the time we're at May 26, which is when we do go to expanded indoor and outdoor capacity and changes in our travel policy, we'll be in a better place. But should we see trends that are troubling or see protocols that need to be strengthened, we will do so earlier. We're not at that point today, but we always monitor. And on, on a national level, Dr. Fauci was um, on TV this morning talking about the increase in cases among children um, and it's being linked to athletics and being outside, possibly being unmasked around each other for long periods of time. I asked that last week, but I always like to follow up. Is this something that we're seeing as a trend in Maine as of last week? The answer I believe was no, but I just wanted to see if there was any advice, especially as we head into summer and um, you know more outdoor activities and kids taking part in camps and things like that, if there was any additional advice um, and anything that you're hearing from pediatricians. Sure, um, Megan, one, one really important note, which is uh, certainly Dr. Fauci's observation is, is correct. And the critical piece of it is, is not so much the gathering, it's the unmasked gathering. And so as, as, a, as just a, you know, a friendly reminder to folks, uh, we want folks to be outside. We want kids to exercise. We want them to be gathering and playing and, and being kids, but they can also do so while wearing a mask, which reduces, any, which reduces the likelihood of transmission. Uh, Megan, to your specific question, we have not seen in younger kids school age kids, elementary and middle school. We haven't seen significant spikes related to sports, sporting activities, things of that nature. We have seen that at the collegiate level, but not at the middle school, elementary school level. And that's a good thing. But again, it's a reminder that we want kids to be outside. We want them exercising. We want them to be active. And they can do those things while staying safe by doing things like wearing a mask while they're doing that. Thank you. Uh, over to Evan Pop next. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, so we've heard from a lot of Mainers who have pre-registered through the state website um, for vaccines and haven't received um, contact from the state with options to set up an appointment um, and ended up registering for vaccines on directly on a provider's link. Um, can you talk a little bit about how many people have registered on the state pre-registration site, how many have been contacted, and just kind of generally how that system is, is designed to work? Yep, uh, I certainly can, Evan. Commissioner Lambrew and I, again, we're, we've been discussing this and uh, we're glad, glad for you to, glad that you've asked that. Let's start with the numbers first. Uh, as of this morning, there have been about 90,000 people in Maine who have pre-registered. And now starting tomorrow with everyone in Maine 16 and over being eligible to, be, uh, to register for a vaccine, we're gonna be doing a couple of things. Uh, the first is that given that everyone in Maine will be register, able to register. We're shifting from pre-registration to now registration. Those who have signed up and raised their hand and say, I want to be eligible, we're going to be back in touch with them to say, thankfully, we have more sites than we expected. And at least as for this week, a, a, a strong supply of vaccines. We're going to be sending those folks who have pre-registered to know to stay tuned. Number one, 
there are a lot of sites out there. Not all of those sites are using the registration system that the state of Maine has set up. And so we're gonna urge folks not to wait for us. If they can go to our website, the vaccinateme.maine.gov website, and then click on the list of all vaccination sites, we're gonna urge folks to register and try to find a spot because they, it may be a little while before they hear from us. But for those who would like to stay with our system, they may hear from us as more and more sites come online. So the bottom line there is that because there are more sites than we thought we'd have, and thankfully more vaccine than we thought we'd have at this stage of the vaccination process, we're able to open up eligibility to all Mainers 16 and over, and thus we're moving from pre-registration to registration now. Um, Commissioner, let me let me pause, and I'm sure there's certain things I, I didn't quite capture there. I would just add that you know we we will for those 90,000 people who are in our system again proactively communicate with them about how to go about getting a vaccine appointment. We do urge people to, when in doubt, use our vaccine hotline. As a reminder, that number is one eight 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 four four five. 4111. And there will be some people who pre registered who will actually hear about appointments at some of those sites that will be using the pre registration. But again, we don't want people to necessarily wait. Look at our sites, find some options that are near you, convenient for you, and directly go to those sites to sign up for an appointment. We are very excited about the large number of doses that we have this week, and we're hoping that people can directly reach out to those providers and sign up. Yep, this is this is good news overall. It, it's in furtherance of our goal to get as many shots in arms as we can. And again, having more sites and more vaccine, that's the way we're going to get there. Hey, um, let me just, uh, if, if I can, just un un make sure that I understand what you're saying correctly. So some of those people, those 90,000 that have pre-registered, um, will be hearing from, from the state tomorrow, likely, when registration opens up, but, but not necessarily all 90,000 of those people. Well, they'll, they'll hear, and what they will hear is, it is time to register. And we will provide a, a link where they can find a list of vaccination sites where they can go and make sure that they are trying to find a spot. Others may, uh, others may at some point in the near future receive a code for a site that's closer by them, but we don't wanna wait for that. We want them to make sure they are getting a shot as soon as possible. Great, thank you. Thanks, Evan. Uh, over to Kevin Miller next. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, two quick uh, clarifying questions, uh, one on the mobile vaccination unit. Um, so it sounds like from what Commissioner Lambert said, those will be operating for more than one day in each site. Is that right? Is there a plan that for is, a specific number of days? That is right. Just because it does take about a half a day to set up and another half a day to take it down, we want to make sure it's there for a few days, also to make sure that those residents have a chance to sign up, not just on one day, but on multiple days. And I do want to go back and correct one inaccuracy that I said. This is not the third um, FEMA-supported mobile vaccine unit. It's the sixth, but it is the second one in New England. So apologies for that. Okay, great. And uh, another clarifying question for Dr. Shaw mm -hmm. um, on the variants. Uh, are, are you also looking or sequencing uh, for that the New York City variant that seems oh. to be emerging? I think that's the B1526. Yep, yep. Um, so... Yes, the answer is yes to that, Kevin. A note about sequencing. Uh, you know, again, um, when we when we do a regular test for COVID, it's a binary result. Does the per was there was there the genetic material found? Was it not found? Sequencing is a little bit different. Uh, it's not a yes or no question. It's not is this one five six or one one seven or is it not? Sequencing is a different inquiry, which is we know it's COVID nineteen which of the thousands of different variants that have been described and are on the various databases, which of those thousands of variants is this? So when we do sequencing and looking for variants, we're not asking a binary question, is it this or is it not this? It's what of this array of variants is this one? So we look for all of them. Okay, so it's not yeah, it's not even just the three that we've mentioned plus New York City. There are, there are others on the list that you're looking for as well. There are actually thousands. Um, thousands. Some of them have been designated as what are called VOCs by the U.S. CDC, which stands for Variants of Concern. There are another sec a section 
that are designated as what are called VOIs, variants of interest. And um, and then, but we don't we don't stop there. When sequencing happens, we look for we look to figure out exactly which branch of the family tree the virus that we're sequencing falls into. Okay, great. And then uh, more more generally, you know, going back to your uh, comments about the kind of the crush of uh, test results that are coming into the lab and trying to keep up with them. Um, just want to make sure you understand I me. Mean, we still are seeing, it certainly seems like case numbers are still rising on, yeah. on most days. Um, so can you talk a little bit just about the numbers that you're seeing? And I know they may not all represent a 24 hour period, but what, yeah. what trend are you, see, are you seeing and it, how concerning is it uh, uh, to you? Or is this kind of just more of that plateauing, you know, Get your yep. thoughts on that. Yeah, let me, let me first talk about the, the processing of positive result piece. You know, for example, today, Kevin, we reported 290 new cases. Um, that's a real number. Now, the, if, but it, because that's the number of tests that we processed and confirmed in the last 24 hours. Um, is it possible that in the last 24 hours across Maine, there were 295 people who actually got tested for COVID? It's possible. Um, because there may be a couple of results that we're still plowing through. So it's not as if the number, the directionality is off. The directionality is clear. It's been going up or at least steady for a while now. We want to make sure that when we talk about those numbers, though, generally when I say there were 290 new cases, the implication is that it was in the last 24 hours. But it may have actually been in the last 48 hours. So that's all. The numbers are true and accurate. And when we update our website, we put them in the right box day by day, but I want to be fully transparent and straight with folks that it may actually not be from the last 24 hours. The 294th case may have been from 30 hours ago. That's all. Um, in terms of what this all means and in, in, in trends, um, it's hard to know, Kevin. Uh, on, on one hand, uh, we, we have been at something of a plateau, although it's been a plateau that's been steadily inching upward. Positivity rates have gone up as well. Up until just a few days ago, hospitalization rates had been steady at about 75. Now they too have ticked up. Those are all concerning. At the same time, Kevin, the average age of people infected with COVID-19 in Maine has gone down. I'm actually huddling with the team in just a bit to go into those data a little bit more, and I'll have more to say about it on Thursday. But if you look at the average age of new cases that were diagnosed in February versus March, you've seen that that number has gone down. Younger people are getting affected. So there are concerning signs on the horizon there. Um, at the same time, vaccination rates are going up. So I think the question is, can we outrun this increase? And we're on a good clip, one of the better performing states. If any state has a good shot of outrunning this increase in, in case rates, it's gonna be made. Great, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, let me turn it to Patrick Whittle next. Thank you very much. Um, just wanted to double check on something that uh, Commissioner Lambrew said a moment ago. Uh, you mentioned that uh, gathering restrictions are set to ease somewhat in May. Uh, the, the day is May 24th, isn't that right? I apologize. I think that is correct. Thank you. Okay, okay cool. I just wanted to make sure I was right about that. That, that includes things like... Um, Ticketed events, town meetings, those, 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 the recent guidances about those, those kind of gatherings. Yeah. So as a reminder, there's overarching gathering limits that affect a bunch of different settings, yeah. and then there's our public health protocols, which within those gathering limits also layer in additional mitigation, including, and the governor is going to continue the requirement that you wear a mask when you're in the public setting the requirement that you keep distance, which is a good public health protocol to try to help people stay safe. So even with increased engagement, which may be made possible by the vaccination, it'll be the case for a while that not everybody in a room or in a crowd will be vaccinated. Children are not going to be vaccinated for a while until there is a vaccine authorized for them. So we are indeed increasing some of the ability for individuals and businesses to engage but we're gonna continue those basic public health protocols. So as we do gather more and then maybe larger sizes, we're doing so safely. Great. You both touched on this briefly earlier. I just wanted to ask a question about uh, double booking. 
uh, there, there haven't been many states that have gotten to this sort of almost everyone is eligible point before Maine, but there are a couple and almost all of them have reported this, uh, I don't wanna call it a problem, but this incidence of double booking where people will jump at the first appointment they can find. Maybe it's really far away, but it's an appointment, I'll take it. But then their number comes up in a wait list that they've been on for a while and it's down the street. <laughs> um, has this become an issue in Maine yet? And is, what is the state doing to, to mitigate it so there aren't a bunch of unfilled appointments? Yep. Uh, Patrick, I, I don't want to call it an issue. It is, I think, what, what you characterize it as is a an happening, an incidence. We, we've heard reports from some providers of instances where folks have uh, found a sooner appointment, but then not canceled out the, the initial appointment they made. And so I think what I would urge folks to do is that if you do find an, a sooner appointment, great. The sooner we can get shots in arms, the better. But please make sure you cancel your existing appointments out so those slots can be freed up for those to snag up. Uh, I, I received a couple of reports from folks over the weekend who uh, had some no-shows. And although we don't know exactly why, uh, one hypothesis is that folks were, they found a, a sooner or a closer spot. Understandable. No question about that, totally understandable. But if you're in that category, do the right thing, cancel out the other appointment so that someone else can take advantage of it. Should, should folks cancel out their appointment once they fulfill the, the sooner one or should they, should they cancel the one they plan not to use right away? I would, I would probably, the sooner the better. So if you find, if you score a sooner appointment, cancel out that other one before you go through with that sooner appointment. You're relatively, if you're relatively sure, which you should be, that you're gonna take that sooner appointment. Otherwise, why would you have booked it? As soon as you get that confirmation for the sooner appointment, do the right thing, cancel out the other one. That means that so many more folks have a, have a chance to grab it. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. take, yep, take thanks, care. Patrick. Yep, take care. Um, over to Bonnie at the Sun Journal. Bonnie, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. In Interscoggin County, the vaccination rates are improving, but there does still remain a lag with the state average. Meanwhile, cases here are rising. And if I read the data right, we're now the second highest in the state, a little bit over 5% positivity with a bunch of new outbreaks. What do you say to a nervous Interscoggin County resident? Well, you know, what we would say is this is a great time and a great week to book a shot. We've worked with providers in Androscoggin County, be it the Auburn Mall, be it commercial or retail pharmacies, uh, including EMS providers, to try to get vaccine to them. This is a big week in the rollout, especially as more folks are becoming eligible. So what I would say is, I understand where you're coming from. Rates are going up, they're going up in Androscoggin County. This is a great week and a great time to get online and find your shot. If getting online is a challenge, as Commissioner Lambrew noted, we've got a phone line that is set up and ready to help you find a spot in Androscoggin County to get your shot. And Commissioner, is the, uh, is the mobile clinic that you announced today, is that what Governor Mills was referenced last week when she said she'd like to see something set up in Lewiston? Uh, we do have uh, Auburn as one of the sites for the mobile vaccine unit, but we continue to look at other options because one of the features of Androscoggin County is that it happens to have more younger people than some of our counties. So we do anticipate the need in that county will be higher as we move to this new phase of eligibility. And that's just a good reminder that going back to this question of with cases ticking up, with questions coming up about our protocol, the best way to continue to be able to engage, getting more people into classrooms, being able to do what we normally do this summer is for people to get vaccinated, especially young people. The more we can get young people vaccinated in the state of Maine, in Androscoggin County, but statewide, the sooner we really all can get at this rise in cases and get back to normal. And will there be a schedule of the mobile clinic? Yes, we're yep. working on posting that and the vaccine appointments will be available on our website when that's ready. Okay, very good, thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, over to Caitlin Andrews. 
Hey, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, first, quick question. Um, what providers are signed up with the state's um, vaccine registration site? Who is partnering with you on that? Um, right now, um, and it's they're not fully live, but right now uh, it is Maine General for the Augusta Civic Center, York Hospital, um, and uh, the large scale vaccination center. Uh, we're, we're working with the center in Sanford to determine whether they want to use it or not. And then there are other smaller groups that have shown interest. For example, groups that for uh, groups of um, what, what do you call it? groups of different physicians that might want to get together and offer vaccinations in their communities, say at a school gym or something of that nature, utilizing the site. And then separately and all along, we've had conversations with the EMS system uh, and, and the main EMS division to determine whether they will migrate over to this site. The, uh, the latest discussions we've had is that the EMS system will as well use the state system. And well, we may not be using that system for the Oxford Hills mobile vaccine unit, unit clinic. We will be using it for future mobile vaccine unit yeah. clinics as well. The most obvious, all the mobile clinics as well, exactly. Okay, and sorry if I missed it earlier, but was there like a timeline of when you think the state will be able to start um, actually like kind of helping people get scheduled for appointments through that? Uh, so for the mobile clinic, um, we were, yes, uh, so the, the best way to get scheduled for the mobile clinic is to call the community vaccination line. Uh, that'll be the fastest, most efficient way. They are ready to go to start taking appointments for the mobile clinic that will start in Oxford. And then subsequently, once we finalize the schedule, those links to register will also be available online. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I'm. Um, I should have been more clear. I meant the um, the registration site. Right. So uh, as we move from as we move to all eligibility tomorrow, what we're in effect doing is saying, okay, for those who are pre-registered, now is your time to go ahead and register. It may be through the state system. It may be through the you know, the, the Hannaford website, uh, which is not yet linked into ours. But as we move to open enrollment or open eligibility for all of those 16 and over, tomorrow will be the day to start working on that. Okay, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the opening up of eligibility tomorrow and equity. You know, how do you see that changing the state's approach to equity? Um, you know, where are we seeing gaps right now and can you give me an idea of where the state is in some of its other efforts like um, consortiums or pop-up clinics? Sure, I'll, I'll start on, on the equity piece. You know, Caitlin, we, we recognize that as we expand eligibility, we don't want certain groups to not have access to vaccine with so many more folks being eligible. That's why you'll see on the allocation for this week that we've made special effort to get vaccine to groups or locations where there are higher risk manners. So for example, oncology clinics, dialysis clinics uh, that, that take care of higher risk, more vulnerable manners, we are making sure that they've got allocations. We're also, as you saw in the allocation, focusing on providing vaccine specifically to places that tend to take care of higher risk manners. There are two in particular. The first are community health centers. Community health centers provide primary care services to a broad swath of Mainers, particularly those that are lower income or live in harder to reach places, critical for our equity work. The other are independent pharmacies. A again, as you'll see on the tracker, independent pharmacies in Maine are receiving significant allocations this week. And that's deliberate. In many places of the state, uh, there may not, it may be a long drive to a hospital, let alone a large scale site. There may not be doctors in town. But there are independent pharmacists, some of whom have been there for years, generations, who are known and trusted and are a voice for being able to get vaccine into their community. So there are, those are the ways that we've tried to keep a focus on equity, even as we expand eligibility. Yeah, I'll just add three, three other examples. Um, we do have what we're calling pop-up clinics for equity. We're allowing community groups to come to the state and say, hey, we have this pocket of people who we can help organize to get a clinic. And we are you, we have been supporting some of those this week at senior centers, community-based organizations, and some churches in Maine. Another area that we're focused on is homebound. We continue to work with home health agencies and others to try to get, get to people who can't leave their homes. And a third is for 
adults with developmental or intellectual disabilities with some sort of challenge in getting a vaccine in a large site. We're working with our different partners to set up maybe drive-through clinics for that type of crowd. So we do continue to look at those pockets of people with particular challenges and try to match those populations with clinics. Um, Commissioner, can you give me an idea of who some of those partners are and who have been kind of doing that work with you this week? Yeah, we're going to be, I think, posting them after the fact. There's a little bit of sensitivity about um, some of them because they're trying to address a community that may, in some instances, be a little hesitant to get a vaccine. So we will start posting those um, over time as we've completed those clinics and give you some data on where they are. But we are letting the communities lead on this um, so they can really reach out to people who, again, beginning tomorrow, are all people who are otherwise eligible to get a vaccine. Okay, and one more question on this equity front. Um, the federal CDC put out a press conference today saying the state is going to receive 18 million in COVID-19 health equity funds. Um, you know, they mentioned something about it could be used for to train people, to help people sign up, but I'm curious about what you would like to see in terms of structural changes that could happen with this money. I'll say a couple sentences and then turn it over to Dr. Shaw. It is such an exciting opportunity for us to be able to have these resources to do the kind of hard work that we were just describing, because trust me, it is hard to not just have everybody and say, go to that big, large throughput site. That would be easy, but that is not going to be as complete, as equitable, as fair, as inclusive as the state of Maine would like to be. So these new resources, which are available over a multi-year period of time, which do direct us to get more communication support for these communities to kind of provide a point person for these can be implemented with this funding. We're just learning about the funding, so our plan's not complete, but we are thrilled with the opportunity. And Caitlin, um, you know, your, your question dovetails really well with Charlie's earlier question around the Office of Population Health Equity, because th that office and, and our resurrection of it is really designed to address some of these structural inequities rather than just sort of program by program try to help out. Uh, there are a couple, there, there's a lot that we could go through, but I'll, I'll just put a spotlight on one uh, that we've talked about at length, which is data. Uh, our data and our thus our insights into what's going on and the solutions that might come from that, our, our data are sorely lacking. This is not a main specific phenomenon. This is a nationwide phenomenon, whether it is around racial and ethnic uh, health status, whether it's around disability status, whether it's around rural versus urban, there are so many ways in which the data that we have and thus our understanding of what's happening are, are quite limited. Grants of this nature are a big one note to the 18 million that you noted in our discussions already around it, which we, we spoke on earlier this morning. Uh, one opportunity is to utilize some of that funding, not just for COVID vaccine, but childhood immunizations in general. As we talk about getting back to the school year next year, getting kids back in the classroom more regularly, we want them to not just be ready to go. We want them to have all their vaccines on board. That funding will be a great way to have that structural change so we can get vaccination rates up. Uh, Thank you. The, yep, you bet, Caitlin. The last question for the afternoon goes to Chris Costa. Hi, Dr. Sean, Commissioner Lynch. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, we can, Chris, five by five. Go ahead. All right. Um, hey, just wanted to check in briefly. Do you know how much the new mobile vaccination unit is going to cost, uh, the, the whole effort? How much is going to be funded by the state and how much by the federal government? Yeah, so at this point, it is a federal, federal government-sponsored activity. There's going to be some need for the state to do wraparound supports, and we are looking at the different sources of federal funding that we've received to support that. Uh, we, at this point, feel confident that it is something that federal government is largely supporting with some ancillary state support, which, again, we're very grateful for the Biden administration. This is part of the strategy that got put out early in the administration's tenure um, with the American Rescue Plan. They included additional funding to support these kind of community vaccine clinics, and we're just really excited to begin to have this vaccine clinic start rolling through Maine next week. Excellent. Um, Dr. Shaw, one thing we've been hearing from uh, more and more people as they get different types of the COVID-19 vaccine, um, some people are having different reactions. I think 
generally what I'm hearing is, is usually after the second dose, people are starting to feel some type of, um, maybe it's common cold symptoms, maybe it's like mild COVID-19 symptoms, kind of some fatigue, um, just generally not feeling well. Can you kind of explain a little bit about why this happens in certain people, what people should expect, uh, generally speaking, and do you know, does it correlate necessarily to one vaccine or another? No, Chris, I want to I say two things about what it does not mean before I talk about what it does mean. What it does not mean is that one vaccine is working better than another. And the other thing it does not mean is that if you did not have those feelings of feeling crummy, it does not mean the vaccine's not working. That is to say, the vaccine is working regardless of whether you feel crummy after your first or second dose. Here's what's going on. The feeling that you feel after you get your shot, whether it's the first shot or the second shot, that feeling of being a little run down, maybe feeling a little flu-like, that is your body's immune system kicking into high gear. The reason that more folks feel it after their second shot as opposed to after their first shot is that the first shot primes the problem. The first shot tells your body's immune system, be ready, get ready. So that if you see this virus or any of the particles again, you will be ready to go and kick it into high gear. The second shot fortifies the body's immune system to actually go into high gear. And so when you get that second shot, your body's immune system is already primed. It's ready to go and it kicks into high gear to fortify itself for the future. That's why you feel a little bit crummier after your second shot, after your first shot. It's your body's immune system getting ready to go. But if you don't feel that way, it's okay. The vaccine still works. That, that, that difference doesn't really seem to vary too much vaccine to vaccine. The last important thing, Chris, this is not what we talk about when we talk about side effects or adverse events. When we talk about adverse events, we talk about something far more serious. So a lot of people say, oh, I saw online that 20% of people have an adverse effect after the shot. I don't wanna get it. It's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is folks feeling a little feverish, feeling a little run down for six or eight or 12 hours, and then being back durable. That's not what we talk about when we talk about adverse events. Don't be scared of getting the shot. You might feel a little crummy for a bit, but it's absolutely worth it compared to the benefit you get. Gotcha. And, and so a re reaction like that would be normal? It would be. It's 100% normal. 100% normal. Hmm? Um, I'm wondering if I, either one of you would be able to just kind of weigh in on, on a phenomenon, or I guess sort of as you referenced earlier, sort of a happening or an incident uh, that, that we have noticed. Um, Obviously, the eligibility opens up widely for those 16 plus on Wednesday. Um, there were some people who were able to secure appointments um, and and show up. At, I think particularly it was happening at like a federal retail pharmacy partner um, where they were basically asked, you know, if they were if they met one of the current eligibility requirements, whether that's uh, being age 50 or older, being an educator, um, and, it, and it basically what it sounded is that there were people who did not meet either of those. Uh, categories, criteria, um, and the workers at the locations still decided to administer the shot to them anyway. I'm wondering, one, did you guys get any reports of that? And two, your reactions to hearing that? I'll just begin by saying, yes, we had heard that all along. This has been a challenge, and it's a challenge of having 50 states with 50 different sets of eligibility rules, whereas these pharmacy programs are often, you know, multi-state, if not national. So, it was something that we experienced. We did along the way um, talk to our partners to make sure they understood the main rules and were following those rules. I can say, I think um, on behalf of Director Shaw that we're very relieved that tomorrow that ends. Tomorrow is the day where we begin to not focus on who is and who is not eligible, but how do we get everybody who is eligible to those states? People across the state, people of different age groups, people in different employment groups, um, we're looking forward to vaccinating people in the hospitality industry and people in the food processing industry and people who work in all sorts of settings. We look forward to vaccinating people in higher education, as well as hopefully when the authorization comes through for vaccination for kids under the age of 16, them as well. But for now, we are moving to this new phase where anybody age 16 and older who's a resident of Maine, resident of Maine can get vaccinated in Maine. And we're just excited for the prospect of putting aside the eligibility rules and just going to work to get getting shots in arms. 
Thanks a lot, Chris. And um, Commissioner, I'm going to turn it back to you to close this up for the afternoon. Uh, and exciting news around the mobile unit. There's a, a lot going on as we expand access points. So I'll turn it back over to you. Sure. And I'll just say that the mobile vaccine unit is one great example of a partnership between the main emergency management agency, the federal emergency management agency, all sorts of people in communities across the state of Maine. But it's not the only one. We're so excited about <clears throat> how well our provider community has rolled up its sleeves to help out how our emergency medical services have, and how we continue to find new partners. We just learned in the past week that more chain pharmacies, for example, are being activated in Maine. And what that is a good reminder of is every week, the sites that are available will change. So if you haven't had a vaccine, check out that site, search Maine COVID-19 vaccine sites, and you will find a list of those sites. We're gonna improve that website that will be ongoing and active. And we do urge people, don't wait. Don't wait to get an email from a pre-registration system. Don't wait till you think there might be a, a lower line because you never know what kind of appointments open up when people start canceling, when people realize there are other opportunities for them. We are just excited to, again, have people look for those appointments. And again, if you need help getting a ride, you can call and get a ride from the state of Maine. And if you need help getting an appointment, you can call our vaccination hotline which is 1-888-445-4111. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much for your time this afternoon. Have a great day. We will talk again soon.